Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Intellectual Freedom in You, a Banned Books Week webinar. Book bans are on the rise across the country as states seemingly compete to see who can place the most restrictions on free speech. As this latest wave of censorship activity continues to build, what is your role as a library user? In this interactive webinar during Banned Books Week, you'll learn about why intellectual freedom is important and what you can do to support libraries, library workers, and free expression during these challenging times. Uh, and tonight's uh, presentation uh, is led by Martin Garner, PhD, Director of Amherst College Library. He's also the chair of the American Library Association's Intellectual Freedom Committee, and he's the editor of the 10th edition of the Intellectual Freedom Manual. So all 100 of us watching live and the hundreds more that will watch on demand, let's give Martin a big virtual round of applause. And Martin, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks, Robert, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I will uh, gladly say that I am now the past chair of the Intellectual Freedom Committee. It's a big job, and I am glad to have uh, given it on to somebody else because uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of good people doing the work. Uh, so I'm so glad that all of you uh, decided to join us, and I'm going to be asking a little bit later uh, what brought you here. Um, but what I'm going to do is tell us what we are going to see here. So let's see what you can expect for tonight. Uh, and I'm coming to you from South Hadley, Massachusetts. So I'm waving at you from the center of the state uh, to my friends in the east. So what can we expect? I'm going to lay some groundwork so that we are all on the same page when it comes to terminology. Um, we are going to talk about what you should know about the challenges that have been happening uh, and also talk about um, how you can help because this is not uh, something that we who work in libraries can uh, manage by ourselves. We need your assistance uh, and we will have some time for discussion. Uh, my, my general plan is uh, I'm going to ask you for some input a, a couple times during the presentation, but we're mainly going to have you uh, have questions at the end. Um, as uh, Robert mentioned, if you put them in the Q&A option, that will make sure we'll, we'll, we, th that tracks it really nicely there. Um, other stuff in the chat, uh, I will ask you to put in the chat because that flows up a little bit faster. Sometimes it can be harder to keep track of that. So if you have a question that you want to uh, ask, uh, make sure that you get that question into the Q&A. Uh, that way we will see it. All right, so what is intellectual freedom? Um, it's in the title of the webinar. And what I want to do is find out what you think intellectual freedom means. If you hear that phrase and someone said, intellectual freedom, what's that? How would you explain it? So using the chat, how would you try to explain what you think intellectual freedom means? This is the interactive part. Quentin says it's freedom of expression. We have freedom to learn from Amy, freedom of thought from Sharon, freedom to research. Oh gosh, now it's, now it's just going really big. Ability to explore whatever interests you. No one tells me what to think. Freedom to think independently freedom to learn, freedom for civil discourse, your ability to choose what to learn and what you read, uh, access to information, the right to source and consume information as I choose, freedom to learn and explore whatever you want. Lots of great answers here. These are, let me see, I've got a couple more. Ability to think, talk, and write about on a variety of topics, allowing us to share our interpretation of the data, to explore different and opposing views, I think we got a question that's coming up that we will save for later on, uh, free discourse. So those are all great examples of uh, a, a great way to describe intellectual freedom. I like to think about it in three different ways, which kind of giving a little hint here from my slide of the three freedoms. And so the first one is freedom of expression, uh, which is something that came up uh, a couple times verbatim in the chat. And so I, it's important for people to be able to express themselves on any topic that they want to discuss. 
uh, because uh, as people who are consuming information, um, if someone doesn't have the right to say it, then we don't have the, we'll never be able to read it. And so you have to be able to express yourself uh, in order for intellectual freedom to exist. The next one is freedom of access. And again, a lot of you got to this point in the chat definitions. Um, it doesn't matter if someone has been able to say something or write something or create something, but we cannot access it for whatever reason. If it has been limited access in our community or it's not even purchased for our community, or if we don't have the skills to access it, so education is important. Um, if we don't have uh, the, the technology to access it, so much is available online. Uh, and if you don't have broadband these days, you might as well not have access to the internet at this point. So uh, access is really uh, central to making sure that people can exercise their intellectual freedom. Uh, they have to be able to get to what they want. They have to be able to get past any barriers that are in their way um, and then be able to consume it in a way that makes it useful. Now, this third one is one that I, I don't think I saw this topic, uh, this idea come up, um, but it is freedom from surveillance, which is kind of a fancy way of just saying privacy, but you know, I, I like the three freedoms idea, so I came up with three ways to say it. And privacy is important to intellectual freedom because if you feel like you are being watched or monitored, um, you may not look up controversial topics. You may not look up uh, things that you uh, don't want people to know that you're interested in. And so if you're researching a sensitive topic, because maybe it's something that you disagree with with the rest of your family, or maybe it's something that's an unpopular view with at your workplace or with your friends. Uh, you want to feel like you can uh, look at those uh, items, look at that information without having someone watching over your shoulder. And that's hard to do in the digital age because there's so much stuff that's being tracked online. The library is one place. Uh, one, one place, there, 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 are, there might be some others, but the library is one of the most reliable places where you can go. And have a sense that uh, because you are there that you can uh, be working with people who you trust uh, to keep your information safe and to not be tracking what you're looking at. So those are the three freedoms that for me make up intellectual freedom. Now, Banned Books Week, I just wanna talk a little bit about this because here we are, this is actually Banned Books Week. I'm sure this is something that you've heard of uh, because did you know that this year is actually the 40th anniversary of Banned Books Week? It's a big year. Um, so this first started in 1982. It's a project um, originally of the Office for Intellectual Freedom from the American Library Association, but we have a lot of partners around. A lot of people have gotten excited about this. And uh, it's, it's been around uh, and was introduced as a way to promote awareness of the challenges that uh, library materials have been receiving for a very long time. Um, and it's not just library books that get challenged, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And so this has been a programming effort um, that uh, is, is meant to raise awareness, and this is why you're here. Um, it is uh, sometimes controversial because people hear the word banned books and they start to kind of decide, is that the right term? Should we, you know, is it really banned because, you know, one library might remove it from the shelves, but I can go get it somewhere else. So that, that's not a ban. Um, it's not like the book has been confiscated by the government and destroyed or prohibited from coming. Um, but if you th think about it, if you have someone who uh, may not be able to go to the next town over where they could get access to a book. If they're a school student and their school library is the most reliable place where they could go to get a book, if it's not available there, then for all intents and purposes, the book is banned for them. And so uh, while we've gotten some pushback over the years around the title, and I will tell you that when I was a librarian uh, back in uh, Colorado, uh, where I lived for about 24 years and was working at a, at a university there, we had a uh, professor who came in and saw that we had a banned books display. And he was upset because he said, well, technically they're not banned. And so I, I don't like this title. Um, and and uh, actually 
bullied a staff member into changing it so that it said um, controversial materials instead. Um, and, and that actually was uh, not well received by the library staff that he came in and did that. Um, and at this point, after 40 years, Banned Books Week is something that a lot of people know about. And if we changed it to Challenge Materials Week or Challenge Materials Month or something, it just doesn't have quite the same ring to it. So that's a little bit about Banned Books Week. All right, let us continue on and talk about those challenges. And so what sort of things are getting challenged today? There are two main categories where now we have, we have uh, books get challenged for all, all sorts of reasons. And if you've ever seen uh, the, the top 10 list of, of items that are getting challenged, um, there are some themes that come through over the years, <clears throat> a lot of things related to sex, things related to violence, uh, language, uh, inappropriate language, depending on what age you think should be reading the book. Uh, you also have uh, challenges about religion, challenge about morality. Um, so there are uh, challenges about <clears throat> um, offensive language that's in the book, not just uh, there's offensive terms and offensive language. So kind of two different categories if you have profanity versus language and words that you might not like. And so uh, these have been some fairly uh, standard topics. Um, and uh, but in, in, the, in, in recent years, uh, especially in the, in the big uptick in challenges we've seen in the last couple of years, we are seeing um, challenges in two broad areas. And one includes anything related to LGBTQIA plus content. And so we are seeing materials that uh, either if they are written by or about members of uh, the queer community, that uh, these books are getting uh, challenged, um, especially if these are books that are intended for younger readers. Um, and especially it seems that anything related to transgender content. Um, and we have seen this in, uh, in extreme cases such as uh, the state of Florida. You probably have heard about, heard about the law that is being called the don't say gay law, which is uh, prohibiting uh, the discussion of topics related to sexual orientation and gender identity uh, from certain grades in schools below a certain age, you just can't talk about it. And so that's an outright ban on the topic and books related to that would, would be falling under that. We're also seeing content like that being uh, attacked, not just in Florida, but around the country. Um, there was a, a group and, uh, that was doing a campaign called Hide the Pride, uh, where they would go into libraries that had put up uh, Pride Month displays, usually in June, um, and they would uh, check out all the books and then say they're not going to return them and just take the books and hide them in different spots in the library because they didn't think that that should be on display. Um, that, um, so it's not just uh, some of the uh, more politically conservative states where these things can happen. Um, and we have had reports of this happening all around the country. And so this is one area that continues to be one of the top reasons that things get challenged. Uh, another area that is getting a lot of uh, traction uh, in the last couple of years is things related to critical race theory. And critical race theory is something that you, you've probably heard about. It's become a buzzword. Um, and it's important to know what critical race theory actually is. It's, it's a graduate level uh, systematic way of thinking about the impacts of racism. Uh, it started out as uh, something coming from legal studies and then has been broadened to be applied in other fields. Uh, it's some of the uh, tenets of critical race theory include thinking about acknowledging that racism is real, um, that intersectionality is something to consider where you have maybe multiple uh, aspects of your identity that can impact your experience. So it's not just about race, but also about gender and about class, uh, about orientation. And so all of those things can mix together and intersectionality is part of that. Um, and uh, that there, there are a number of aspects to it. It's not just uh, talking about race. Um, critical race theory is something that people apply uh, to uh, 
situations and, and things they're trying to study you know, at a pretty high level. And so I am uh, very confident when I say that critical race theory is not being taught in the schools, but it has been at least at the K-12 level. Um, graduate school, sure. Undergraduate in some places, yes. But K-12 schools, it's not what it's being talked about. But we have had concerns about anything related to race as being uh, critical race theory. And so you may have heard in Texas uh, where uh, a, an employee in the Department of Education put together a list of 850 titles. Uh, and they uh, were anything related to race and sex, just kind of did a keyword search and all this information came up. Uh, and so, uh, and then check, sent this list to the schools to say, what, uh, you know, who's got, I wanna know who has this, which is a pretty scary thing when you've got someone asking to get rid of hundreds and hundreds of books. And so we're seeing books that are about race that acknowledge that race is something that happens, that race, is, that race is, has an impact on our society, that acknowledge that slavery existed in our, in our country um, and other uncomfortable uh, aspects of our history. That's also what's getting challenged. And it's not just books that are getting uh, challenged. We have uh, online resources that are getting challenged. Uh, there is, uh, you, you may not know the provider of these resources, but one of the primary ones that a lot of libraries use is called EBSCO. Uh, and they uh, provide databases like Academic Search Premier or um, business databases, education databases, a range of things that a lot of different types of libraries subscribe to. And there was, uh, there is uh, uh, a couple of people in Colorado in fact, uh, ha happened in the state that I used to live in, uh, that decided that uh, EBSCO was allowing pornographic materials into its uh, collections and that people in schools were able to uh, search for pornography and find it through EBSCO. Now, uh, when given this information, uh, librarians were not able to actually replicate their search and they could not pull up information that, that uh, met the, the criteria. Um, but uh, this couple was so convincing about uh, the, their concerns that they actually convinced hundreds of schools in Colorado to drop their subscriptions to the EBSCO databases, just cutting out access to thousands of journals and magazines that students were using for research. And it wasn't just in Colorado. The state of Utah actually turned it off for the entire state because they have a statewide contract uh, for a couple of months until they were able to get it back on. Um, and there have been attacks uh, or, or to this uh, all around the country. Uh, and it's, it's a challenge because uh, if you are cutting off entire platforms it's like saying, you know what, we're not gonna buy any more books from Simon & Schuster. The entire publisher is gone. And so if you're cutting out entire platforms, um, and in some cases, this might be the only uh, information uh, database provider that you have, then it really has an impact on what people can do. Um, also examples of OverDrive. If people are familiar with OverDrive as an ebook provider and uh, concerns that there could have been a book that was racy on OverDrive. And so some libraries, again, a library in Texas, cut off access to OverDrive, which meant that uh, library users who are homebound and cannot get to the library and who depend on eBooks uh, for their content were suddenly cut out from the library with no recourse. And so uh, these challenges can have wide ranging impacts uh, depending on how they're implemented. Programming has also been a big challenge. Um, and some of the, it, it's topics that, um, again, are not dissimilar to what we see challenges when it comes to books uh, and other resources. So programming that touches on uh, sexuality. You may have heard about Drag Queen Story Hour, uh, uh, something that's been a popular program at libraries around the country. Uh, and has been uh, a cause for a lot of concern for folks who don't think that that's appropriate. And so the programs get challenged. And sometimes this is a uh, reason for actually changing the policy of who's allowed to do the programming uh, and what sort of uh, people are invited in. Uh, also, um, 
not just programs that are put on by the library or that are put on by another group that is borrowing library space. That's often times what's happening, but also groups that are having meetings. And so groups that might be considered by some to uh, be uh, what they, they might, uh, opponents might label them as hate groups. And, and whether it is something where they don't agree with their politics or they don't agree with their beliefs, uh, and people find that distressing to have those groups meeting at their library. And so there were protests about that and who should be allowed to use meeting rooms. So that's kind of the big picture in terms of what are some of the, the big, the challenges we're seeing both to uh, stuff, um, to the, uh, you know, not just the, the books that, we're, that we are normally have on our shelf, um, but also to have uh, challenges to the resources you get through the computer, uh, resources you can access from home, um, the types of programs and services you see at the library. Uh, so it's, it's a range of things that are, that are coming after. And, and what are some of the, the impacts of that also include uh, not just loss of access to the materials, but we also have also had libraries who are having their funding cut, who are having uh, their, their staff um, are, are either resigning out of protest or are getting fired because they are trying to push back against um, governing bodies that don't want to support uh, free access uh, to information. And so uh, it really becomes a, a difficult situation. And so there are things that we need to uh, get help. And this is what we're going to talk about next, where we can get some help from you. So. In terms of ways that you could support free expression, one way that you can support free expression is to get educated about the issues. And so actually coming to a program like this is a great way to do it. Uh, you can also uh, stay uh, informed by following stories in, on the local news. If you still have local newspapers, uh, that's another thing that's in danger, but we can talk about that another time. Um, and uh, find out what, uh, you know, what, what's, what's happening and why things are happening so that when you hear about stories, you can uh, uh, be educated about it and know what, know what the issues are uh, so that you can then speak up. Um, maybe you are in the grocery store and you hear someone talking about, oh gosh, you know, did you hear that they were, uh, there's some people upset about uh, books at the school and I hear that, that those books are filled with all, all sorts of trash. And you can say, actually, uh, I, I, I know about those books. I, I read them myself. And I, I, I think that you know, they're being, it's being blown out of proportion or it's being taken out of context. Uh, and so that you can actually speak up and help correct some of the misinformation that is used when uh, items in libraries, when programs at libraries are being challenged uh, unfairly. Uh, you can also speak out. There are uh, times when we need to have the public come and support the right to uh, free expression and the right to have uh, access to information uh, when there are uh, challenges that are made uh, either in public libraries or in school libraries. And often these, these will be uh, times at the boards, uh, board meetings where you can uh, sign up to speak and talk in favor of having access to information. Uh, I wanna be clear uh, that something that librarians have talked about for a long time when it comes to uh, the role of parents and their, uh, their guidance for their children in access to information. We absolutely believe that it is parents' right. It's a parents' right to uh, guide their children's reading and to, uh, to teach them about uh, what they think is right for them to see and to read, um, but only for their kids, not for the rest of the community. And so if you have something that you don't want your kid to read, then talk to your kid about not reading that book. If you wanna make sure that they don't check them out, then you should go with them to the library and help them choose books that you think are appropriate. But it's not your place to decide what's appropriate for the other children of the community or for other people's, uh, other people's kids. They have, uh, those parents, those guardians have the right to decide what their kids can see. And so I wanna be really clear that parents, Please parent your children, but try not to parent mine. Uh, it is important to also educate your representatives about what the issues are and what you believe in. Um, a lot of times when we hear about book challenges, 
or other items that are being uh, attacked. Um, there are social media campaigns that whip up uh, a lot of support that's based on misinformation or, or fears or concerns and uh, encourage people to contact their representatives to talk about their concerns. Um, and so people who support the materials have to say the same, uh, have the same message come out and uh, contact, you know, whether it's your local board of trustees or if there are, uh, if there's legislation that's being considered at the state level, contacting your state representatives, state senators, and saying, uh, this is why we believe in free expression. We believe that it's important for people in this country to be able to exercise their First Amendment rights. We think that an educated citizenry is an informed citizenry, and so therefore we do not like this bill for X, Y, and Z. And so once you are educated uh, about this, then you need to talk to your representatives about it. Uh, it's important to support your library, the place where you are getting access to this information, uh, because uh, libraries exist to provide access to information, and we do it with your support. We do it, uh, public libraries are, are tax-supported uh, entities, and they are that way because they are a public good, and they want to make sure that you are getting access to information so that you can learn about what you, what you need, uh, but that does take resources. It takes the support of, of hiring staff who are trained, uh, educated in running libraries and in selecting materials uh, and making the most of the budgets that they have. Um, and it takes money to pay for the information. Um, while it doesn't cost anything to check out a book, uh, it does cost something to, to buy that book and to process it and get it on the shelves and circulate and do all those things. Um, and so when libraries are getting their fundings cut by um, governing bodies who might disagree with uh, you know, a few items that are in the collection uh, can really have a negative impact on what they are able to do for, uh, for their community. So supporting your libraries in terms of uh, making sure that they've got the adequate funding is really important. I would also encourage you to think about running for office, um, especially at the local level. Uh, if it's library boards, uh, school boards, uh, have a lot of authority when it comes to the governance of libraries in terms of supporting the professionals who run the place and, and uh, providing uh, the backup for the work that they do. And so if you really feel strongly about supporting free expression uh, and then and you've, if you have the time to do it, then I would encourage you to get involved in, uh, in local government in this way. Um, because it is, it's an important thing to make sure that your views are represented in your community in that way. Uh, all of these things in terms of speaking up and speaking out and talking to folks uh, can be a little scary if you haven't done it before. And so if you're not sure about uh, speaking up at a board meeting, uh, then I would say uh, practice it with a friend you know, uh, write down your, the remarks that you wanna say and, and go over them with someone, practice it with a family member, with a friend and see what it looks like, practice what it's like to write a letter uh, to send to your representatives. Um, becoming an advocate isn't something that happens overnight, but it's something that you need to spend a little bit of time on. And so practice helps. Um, and I would also say that cookies help as well. You know, sometimes if you, if you know that uh, the staff at your library or school has been having a hard time because they've been under the microscope and they've been getting a lot of pushback for things, if you want to uh, show support in other ways, drop off some cookies it's because cookies always make things better. All right, so those are some of the, the, thing, the ways that you can help. And what I want to do now is uh, turn it over to discussion. And I know we've got some questions in, uh, in the Q&A that are coming through, uh, but I am curious, uh, um, and you can use the chat for this. Uh, what is it that brought you here tonight? You know, why did you decide on a Thursday night that I'm gonna sign up to sit in on a webinar uh, after, and if, you know, for me, it's been two and a half years of living on Zoom. And so why am I gonna take some of my free time and sit on, that was even in the chat before this came up. Uh, and so we've got my teacher, we've got Mr. Phelps and some laughter, wants to learn more about opposing book bans, very concerned about free expression in this country. 
worried about the number of book bans. Mr. Phelps is definitely getting some props here. Of, if I'm there, can you hear me? All right. I think I had a little bit of a, uh, a blip there. Uh, Martin, we can hear you now. Okay, great. All right. And oh, and I see some people, a librarian who wants to talk with the public about IF issues. I know that person because we're on a committee together. Hi, Andrea. Um, new library board member in Tennessee, really passing about age appropriate materials in our classrooms. Uh, as a trustee, Vanessa wants to know how to protect their library. Hi, Vanessa. Valuing the books, libraries, and the free exchange of ideas. It's elsewhere, I don't want to see it happen here. I will say that um, bans have, you know, book bans, book challenges are happening everywhere. And we have reports of challenges happening in our fair commonwealth in Massachusetts. And so it is something that happens in communities uh, across the country. Uh, and so education, uh, we are in the children's publishing class at Emerson. Excellent. All right. Distortion of history by limiting uncomfortable topics. So lots of uh, lots of reasons of why people are here. Okay. So um, so that's great. So um, I, I see that we've got some questions coming up in the Q and A. So um, Robert, how about we start going through some of those? Uh, absolutely, Martin. Uh, first question was from Diego. Um, it's from the chat. But as Martin said, I would really encourage folks to ask your questions in the Q&A. So chat will be for comments, Q&A will be for questions. Uh, but Diego asks, and there were similar questions along these lines as well, are there ever any valid reasons to ban books? So Diego, that's a great question. And, and so there are, you know, when it comes to uh, the First Amendment, there are some limits on speech in this country. It's not absolutely free. There are some things that are not covered. Uh, child pornography is illegal. Uh, materials that are, that are obscene are illegal. Uh, so, you know, there should be no child pornography uh, anywhere uh, and not in libraries. Obscene, that's a little tricky because um, we don't get to decide what obscene is. Uh, obscenity is, a, is something that is determined by a court of law. Uh, and so um, what's the difference between pornography and obscenity is whether or not a judge has ruled something to be obscene and then it's obscene in that jurisdiction and is not permitted. Um, and that's where things can get a little, you know, and I will say most libraries uh, do not uh, have a pornography collection. Um, but pornography is often in the eye of the beholder, as some would say. And so what some people might think is a racy romance novel might be counted as, as erotica by others. Um, or if you have a book that is intended for, um, you know, a, a children's book about puberty that includes illustrations, uh, like a book uh, by Roby Harris called That's Perfectly Normal, uh, that's been around for decades uh, and has uh, gotten a lot of acclaim for being a very uh, approachable and effective book about puberty, uh, but also has been charged with being obscene in some jurisdictions, not too far from here, in fact. Um, so, uh, but if something were actually declared to be obscene, then that would fall under, no, that's illegal speech, we can't ban that, or we can't have that. So that would be an appropriate thing not to have in your library. Um, I would say that when it comes to, uh, you know, are there things that, uh, that should be banned from libraries? I think about the larger library ecosystem. Um, there are uh, reasons why librarians arrange our materials. Uh, say in the public library, we have different areas. We have a children's section, we have a YA section, we have an adult section. And so we do put books in those areas that we, uh, in our professional judgment, believe are geared towards those people. And so we will have children's book in the children's area, and we will have young adult books in the young adult area, and we will have books that are intended for adults in the adult area. Um, if you're in a school library, um, there's a lot of thought given about the developmental age of where kids are and what information um, is going to be uh, helpful for them at that point. And it's really hard to say because uh, kids do mature at different rates and people are at different places in their life and, and ready for different things. But 
Um, what I would say uh, is that, you know, there are, there have been times where books that may have been left behind, uh, you know, in an elementary school when an upper grade got moved up to say the middle school, if you had a grade realignment and sometimes books that were intended for older readers don't always follow out. And so there are times where that, uh, you know, it's better to transfer those books to where they are best used. There are other times where there's information that's just plain out of date or wrong. Um, I think about uh, medical books that have bad information. Um, and so uh, there are times where it's good to um, <clears throat> clean up your collection to make sure that you don't have out of date or wrong uh, information in the case of say medical books or, or legal books that are out of date that are giving out bad information. And so it's not that it's a ban, uh, but it's making sure that the information that we do have is useful and appropriate uh, and intended for the communities that we're serving. How about the next question? Sure, so Frank asks, uh, is there an all accepting library system allowing individuals access regardless of the state they live in, allowing them to access books that may have been banned in the state they live in? Well, I am aware of you know Brooklyn Public Library is one that has been providing an electronic uh, an e-card um, but it's been specifically for teenage patrons who are in states where they have uh, you know where they 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 may not have access to a book it's not been done I, I don't believe that they've uh, offered that program for anyone I think they're specifically targeting teenagers uh, because they're having a uh, more difficult access to that material. Um, one of the challenges when it comes to, to expanding uh, ebook access uh, and, and library access in general outside of the jurisdiction that actually supports the institution is that we, libraries usually are making deals with publishers and content providers based on the population area that we serve and we pay a certain rate. Uh, and so uh, that is, uh, you know, it, it's, it can be challenging to extend access along those ways, uh, you know, beyond that, but I, you know, Brooklyn has found a way to do it. Uh, so that is one example um, that I know of where nationwide, if you are a teenager who's having trouble accessing materials at your own library, you should be able to get a card through Brooklyn Public. All right. Um, Frank also asks, when contacting representatives, uh, is there a script or template to follow so that the message is clearly presented and understood? Uh, Frank, yes. Uh, almost every time there's going to be an advocacy campaign, uh, if there's an issue where, where we need to get the public support, at least it's been my experience in working with my, my previous state library associations, and I, I think we probably have some folks from MLA who are here now, uh, where they, talk, they, they do create talking points. Um, and that's something that uh, is generally available. Uh, there all are some, also some library, some national library advocacy groups um, that create talking points on different topics that you can use with legislators. So if you're interested in that, I would reach out to your local library and then we can do some research to find uh, those sources for you. Uh, comment from Elizabeth. I have moved to Florida. I'm trying to inform friends about this threat to democracy uh, through uh, school committee elections. Uh, we need to protect information freedom. Uh, let's see, uh, Shil Shilpa asks, uh, hi, can you talk a little bit about books or materials that have misinformation? Should these types of books be a part of library collections? You know, that's, that's a really great question because misinformation is something that uh, it depends who you ask, uh, whether or not it counts as misinformation. Um, historically, libraries have, uh, <laughs> this is a complicated question, uh, a complicated answer. So um, libraries, when we were purchasing materials only from select publishing houses, and it was a lot easier, a lot harder rather to produce information, there was a lot of trust put in the publishers and editors to make sure that they were uh, publishing uh, information that was verifiable that we could trust and librarians have a lot of different ways that we review materials to decide what we're going to purchase looking at review sources looking at uh, looking at the contents having some subject expertise but looking at the sheer volume of what we have not being able to fact check every single thing 
And so um, there are, you know, th there are historic examples of of books that may have been had some faulty research behind them that have stayed in library collections. Um, in today's world, where we have uh, a lot of information that is not based in what um, well, I would say what I call our, our fact, fact-based information. Um, I think that the challenge is whether or not something is going to actually meet the criteria for a library selection policy. And uh, if you uh, start talking about what is what is misinformation or what is disinformation, um, if you make some decisions about what those things are, uh, then you're going to have to be able to defend those decisions because there are going to be some people who say that's not wrong. That's what I believe, um, and so uh, it can be it, it can be a tricky topic because uh, if you are a library that believes that you should buy the materials that your community is asking for and they're asking to have that information, um, then you can uh, you know do you do you give them that information uh, and do you also do programming about the explosion of disinformation in our in our uh, country uh, and in our world and how that's impacting things and so it's 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 a challenging topic um, that's that's about the best answer I can give right now. Uh, Amelia asks um, most are most <laughs> let me I'll, I'll ask this question why not are most people who try to ban books older persons. So do we have uh, demographics on the type of people who are challenging books? You know, to my knowledge, we're, we're not collecting the demographics on who's challenging books. Um, and I would not say that it is, uh, I, I don't think we can say it's just people of a certain age. I think that there are um, people of all ages who hold a variety of beliefs uh, and uh, whether it is things on the progressive side or on the conservative side, uh, that there are there are challenges coming from across the political spectrum and coming from across a variety of ages. So it's not there's not a single demographic group um, that uh, we can just say that these are the main challengers. Um, but mainly because we don't collect that sort of information, where we're focused more on uh, what's being targeted, not who's doing the targeting. Uh, Marlon asks, who created Banned Books Week? So Banned Books Week was the brainchild of uh, Judith Krug, and she was the director of the Office for Intellectual Freedom from its founding in 1967 until her death um, in the mid-2000s. I think it was 2007 when she passed away. Uh, and so she had the idea of doing Banned Books Week as a way to uh, have libraries uh, promote awareness about uh, the, 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 the dangers of book, book bans and book challenges. Um, and it's been a project of uh, the Office for Intellectual Freedom ever since. Uh, Quinton asks, how does a library develop a policy around restricted but not banned materials? And who decides the limits of said restrictions? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, it is, well, it depends on who is the policy making authority for your library. First of all, we'll just talk about policies in general. If that is something that is entrusted to the staff that gets uh, affirmed or ratified by the board, or if uh, all policies have to be approved by the board, um, that's going to depend on the jurisdiction that you're in. Um, if you have restricted access to materials, and I, I In general, don't believe in placing restrictions on materials because we don't want to. We, we think that any barrier uh, is is not uh, something that serves our our communities well. Um, you know, it's not that it hasn't been done in the past. Um, there, there's a you know, it, um, there was a practice where if you had. Uh, careful you know, materials that you wanted to have restricted, you would keep it behind the circulation desk and you'd have to ask the librarian and they'd decide whether or not you're allowed to, to, uh, to access it. Um, there, you know, there was a whole book about it called For, For Sex See Librarian, because that's what it would say in the catalog card back in the day. Um, 
I would say that when it comes to restricted access, it's we normally try to just focus it on things that are like valuable materials, whether or not it is in uh, our, uh, you know, if it's in our special collections, if it's something that's rare, and then it, you, you decide who has access to that. If you have something that's been donated, uh, archive, archival material, uh, and the donors say that we don't want anyone to access this for 20 years, then that's kind of the access that we're talking about. Um, if you have materials, uh, there, there have been uh, libraries that have been pressured into creating um, you know, what they used to call parenting collections. And they might put materials that are um, intended for young people, but are on topics that might be controversial and they shelve them in the, in the parents' collection or in the adult collection. And so they ask, uh, and so that way kids can't find them easily and instead parents have to try to find them. Um, if you're gonna try to restrict access, it gets hard because um, how do you enforce that? Um, and it, in terms of, if it's gonna be in terms of parents and kids, we really don't wanna put library workers in the role of parents. Uh, and, and just telling a kid what they can and can't check out. It really comes down to, you know, if, if you think that there's materials that you don't want uh, people to access and people have their own thoughts about that, then they should have those decisions, uh, discussions with their families um, and that the library should not be, be making the decisions as to what, what to restrict. Um, let's see, uh, Andrea uh, in the Q&A uh, recommends a resource called Unite Against Book Bans. Uh, it has great talking points, data, and infographics to better understand the topic. Uh, UniteAgainstBookBans.org. And um, Andrea is the uh, co-chair of the Mass Library Association uh, Intellectual Freedom Committee. So uh, I will certainly take her word for that. And, yes. Uh, I will yeah, try to put that in the chat, Andrea, when I have a second. Uh, uh, did you have any response to that resource, Martin? Are you familiar? No, with I was just. I, I am. From, it's it's a new campaign that was actually just launched this year in response to the unprecedented increase in book bans, and it's it is a it is a project of the American Library Association with some other partners. Uh, and so, Andrea, thank you for bringing that up. I really appreciate that. Uh, Karen asks, along with uh, this effort to ban books. You know, I'm not really seeing the subjects of movies, online content, et cetera, in the discussion. Are parents who propose bans also policing their teens' access to other media? Broad bans are an infringement on the rights of others. Uh, so it's, it's not just books that are getting targeted. Um, other resources do get targeted, including media, including films. Um, you know, I, I would say that uh, it's, you know, we, 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 ha we have the same sort of reports that, that uh, films are getting challenged because of content. Um, and, and there are also uh, suggestions sometimes where, where you say, well, you, you have to make sure that if we're enforcing, you know, if you're checking out a movie that you have to enforce the rating system and that you shouldn't let anyone who was under 17 check out an R-rated movie. Um, and, uh, you know, legally, um, the, uh, the MPA rating system is a private, it's a system from a private uh, uh, organization uh, and publicly funded institutions cannot adopt a private rating system to, guarantee, to uh, uh, regulate access to materials. Uh, and so why rating systems are meant to be tools that people could use to uh, decide whether or not they, they want to view something. Um, it's not something that should be used. Uh, there, there's been court cases about this uh, to restrict access. That, that kind of ties back into the previous question. Um, I, I know that some libraries just avoid this by not buying anything that's, that's R-rated uh, and avoid the question altogether. But uh, to get back to your original question, yes, there are, uh, media is being, uh, uh, films, films are also uh, banned in the same way or challenged in the same way. Uh, and my example earlier of the EBSCO databases would be an example Example of entire article databases that are getting attacked uh, for the accusation of having um, inappropriate materials. Uh, Teresa asks, are most banned books for teens and children? And she also asks, is there a list of banned books somewhere online? It does seem that a lot of the materials these days that are getting the most attention are ones that are intended for 
uh, young adults and children, that is, that is correct. And uh, there is something that's put out every year from the American Library Association of the top 10 uh, banned books list. And, and that's something that I, I know someone will be able to pop into the chat for us. Um, and this is something that they've been tracking for decades. And so they actually can give you the top 100 books from the last, you know, the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, it's, not, uh, it's not just books for uh, teens and young adults, but a lot of times because it's, it's uh, the concerns are about whether or not uh, a student might be you know, if a parent doesn't want their kid reading it yet, it might be something they come across in school, you know, whether it's, it's uh, uh, you know, older books like Of Mice and Men uh, or, um, you know, newer books that uh, are meant to, you know, uh, interest uh, young adults and, and write about life as they're experiencing it. Um, they seem to be the most controversial. So, so uh, they, they, I would say that they are the, the larger, um, uh, they do rep represent a large proportion of what's getting banned. Uh, this is a fun question. Camilla wants to know, do you find banned books more interesting to read than regular books? You know, uh, it, it's kind of a, uh, you know, a, a joke amongst uh, authors that if, if you get your book on a banned book list, then you have just hit the jackpot because sales will go through the roof because people want to find out what the challenge is. Um, and, uh, you know, personally, I find, you know, if I'm reading something that, that uh, has caused other people to be upset, um, it's probably because there's interesting material in it for me. Uh, and so I, um, you know, I, I think that they can be really interesting. Um, sometimes I have a hard time seeing what got someone, someone else upset, but I, uh, I, I am kind of a stereotypical librarian in that I read a lot. And so there's not a lot that's gonna, that's gonna get my attention. Uh, let's see, I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, let me ask you to comment on a couple of things that were brought up in the chat. Uh, this is from someone who I think uh, is following uh, these issues closely. Uh, first, uh, do you have any uh, comment on um, the um, removal of uh, certain uh, Dr. Seuss books uh, due to uh, racist imagery. Are you familiar with that? And, I, and I any am, thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I am familiar with that. You know, and and uh, especially now that I'm living right by Springfield, um, it feels like it's something that I should be paying attention to. And so this is a this is um, this is an interesting one because it's really about copyright. Uh, and you know the 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 Seuss estate, which still holds the copyright to all of the Dr. Seuss books, has the uh, they have the authority as, as, an, as does any other copyright holder to decide whether or not they want their books to be in print or if they're going to remove them from, from, uh, say, uh, from being sold. And so in the case of the Dr. Seuss books, it was the Seuss uh, organization that said, we don't believe that these six titles are ones that we want to have in print anymore because we feel that they have uh, in, in their own estimation, um, uh, outdated characteristics that were seen to be racist. And so it wasn't a ban of, uh, you know, the, the books were not, are, the books have not been banned. Um, what we have seen is uh, books getting, those books actually getting stolen from libraries uh, because they were seen as being more valuable uh, and could fetch a higher price on the open market. Um, we had some libraries that moved those books into special collections because they were concerned about them getting stolen um, or because they, they wanted to have them in a place where they could provide some context for the materials, where they have some other historical materials uh, that are not on the general shelves. Um, and so um, it's, you know, technically the Seuss books have not been banned, but I know it can be a fine distinction because you say, well, why aren't they being published anymore? Well, it was the, 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 uh, you know, the owner of the copyright it was the one who decided we don't want these books in print anymore. Uh, it wasn't the government who told them you can't, you can't censor, you can't have that anymore. Uh, and another issue that came up in the chat several times uh, was from uh, someone, and I'm going to use their language. I don't necessarily, um, I'm not sure I would say it this way, but I'm going to use their language. Uh, do you have any comments on the Mass Board of Library Commissioners efforts to get Hoopla to censor their content. So are you sort of uh, 
familiar, I, and I'm not sure I would, you, that's, I'm not sure that's necessarily coming from MBLC, but uh, are you sort of familiar with the situation uh, with Hoopla? I, I, I am familiar with it, you know, to, to some extent, you know, Hoopla is not a resource that we use at the academic level, um, but uh, in, you know, this, from what I understand uh, of the situation, uh, there, you know, the material, it, it's like having a publisher and you have access to everything. Uh, and there were some materials that um, if, you, if libraries had been selecting materials, uh, individual titles based on their collection policies, these ones may not have gotten through. Uh, they may not have met the criteria, but since it was either an on off for the publisher, um, then there is uh, some thought that, well, the publisher should be thinking about the, what criteria they have for including things in their collections. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, you know, one thing that, that is often uh, seen as, uh, you know, uh, that I, I've seen a lot online in terms of responses to book bans is, if there's something you don't wanna read, then don't read it. If there's a book that you don't like on the shelf, leave it on the shelf and leave it for somebody else. Uh, and so, um, uh, and I understand that it's hard if, if, if you are, uh, you know, if, if you want to feel comfortable with the materials that you're providing access to your community that has gone through the same vetting process that other materials have gone, uh, that, that, that are in your, in your collection have gone through, I could see why you would ask a vendor to do that. Uh, but uh, again, it gets challenging because what's uh, just uncomfortable for one person is fine for another. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we got so many great questions here at the end. Uh, I do want to sort of honor my uh, one hour commitment here. I, I do want to ask you one last question, Mark, sure. and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Michelle asks, do you have any tips on how to explain the banned book frenzy to our children? That's a great question. I would say that when I think about the, the great increase you know, that we've seen in book challenges in the last couple of years in, in particular, it's coming at a time of great societal change uh, where um, there, there's a lot of uncertainty. The pandemic um, has profoundly changed uh, our lives in, in a way that has, has impacted uh, us for generations to come. Uh, and, uh, you know, social justice movements, uh, an, an awareness of uh, the persistent inequality around the world um, have all um, created opportunities for people to be feeling uncertain and to be nervous about change. And uh, one way to not want to think about change is to not read about it, to not have the stories that we tell ourselves about the way the world is be challenged and to put ourselves in an echo chamber where we only hear the things that we want to hear. Uh, and that can go for anyone, uh, regardless of your where you fit on the political spectrum that we, we, we are definitely, uh, I feel at a point where we are just uh, consuming the media that we want to, uh, that, that tells us that we're right. And so, um, since we can do that with our curated news sources and with the sites that we follow on social media and the limited media that we get from the mainstream media or from, from alternative uh, sources of news, um, we can control all of that. Um, but then, we, then what happens if there's a book that, that brings up an idea that we don't like? And so we're trying to exert that same control on the information bubble that we created for ourselves. We're trying to uh, control the bubbles for other people as well. Um, and people are feeling more emboldened to do that because um, these are scary times. And uh, if, if change is hard for you, then we try to stop change. And, and one way to stop change is to not uh, let ideas uh, have the freedom that they need to survive. So Martin, I really I want to I want to thank you uh, tonight uh, for this presentation, uh, folks. Uh, in the chat, uh, if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, if you got anything out of it, uh, let Martin know in the chat um, what you thought of tonight's presentation. Martin, I'll come back to you in about thirty seconds for any closing uh, comments you have. Uh, but folks, just a reminder: uh, you'll receive an email from me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, a link to this recording, and information about some other upcoming uh, virtual programs that. 
that might be of interest. Uh, also, I'll include uh, Andrea's uh, resources that uh, she mentioned in the chat. Uh, and I also want to thank the 30 or so libraries that partnered with Tewksbury tonight. Uh, I thought this program was 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 a great success, and uh, so happy that more uh, more than 100 of you uh, watched live. So, Martin, do you have any last words for the audience? Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to to spend this hour with us and to talk about this. Um, and and I know that uh, you know, just like in anywhere else in the world, uh, uh, you know how uh, information should be handled uh, and uh, what the roles of libraries are, um, and that's okay. Uh, it's okay for us to disagree. It's okay for us. Uh, to um, to have spaces where we can talk about stuff and learn from each other. Uh, and so the more that we could do that, um, and the library is a great place to learn about stuff uh, and to uh, challenge yourself and to engage with others around topics that are important to us. So thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you all. I hope everyone uh, has a happy Band Books Week. All right, everyone have a great night. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.